Good morning, everyone. Good to have everyone here. We have a, a bigger crowd. I was hoping a little more sun, but it's still a little uh, overcast and uh, um, cloudy and a little cool maybe, but we got all everybody wrapped up in blankets, so that's good. And, and uh, my heart is warm seeing everyone here, so I'm very thankful to have everyone here. Several years ago, a friend of my wife's was keeping a foreign exchange student in her house and was challenged with the following question from her. What does the word redemption mean? That's a tough question. How do you explain such a spiritually meaningful concept? She decided to ask the student why she wanted to know. And the girl replied, someone told me that instead of throwing the cans away, I'm supposed to take them to the redemption center. As with many words in this dying world of ours, the word redemption has lost much of its spiritual meaning. But as I was compiling all the parts for our service today, that, that word kept coming to the forefront of my mind. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul has much to say about the human condition. In the 23rd verse of chapter 3, he reminds us that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In the 23rd verse of chapter 7, he tells how the sin in our life enslaves us and holds us captive. And in the 23rd verse of chapter 6, we read that there is a price to be paid to release us from the bondage of our sin. For the wages of sin is death. Death. Who would be willing to pay such a steep price for our redemption? Who could possibly love us enough to lay down their own life? In Ephesians 1 and 7, we find our answer to these questions. In Him, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that He lavished on us. The Greek word for redemption in this passage is apolytrosis, which means to be purchased out of the marketplace to be set free. Slavery, of course, was a very prominent institution in the ancient Roman world. Slaves were sold, purchased, and traded daily in the town marketplaces. And although extremely rare, sometimes a redemption price would be paid in a slave market for the sole purpose of setting an individual free. Many times, the continual paying of the redemption price actually kept the slave markets flourishing. Slave traders could get four times as much per person from families redeeming their loved ones over and over again. So the price of redemption was paid over and over again instead of once for all. The story has been told of a man who saw a young girl being sold in a slave market. He had compassion on her. And he came forward and paid her redemption price. When she was brought to him, he told her she could go because she was free. What does that mean? She asked him. It means you can choose for yourself what you want to do and where you want to go. And then he asked her, where would you like to go? And of course, with tears of joy in her eyes, she replied the obvious. I want to go with you. It's our hope this morning that as we further discuss our great Redeemer, our great High Priest, that you would come to the same conclusion and have only one desire, to choose to follow the one who paid the price once and for all, Jesus the Christ. Back in chapter 6 of our John study, when Jesus asked Peter if he was going to leave him, like so many others had, Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? For only you have the words of eternal life. Let us focus on the redemption of our Savior Jesus Christ as we offer our worship to God this morning. The order of service this morning will be as follows. 
We're going to mix it up a little bit since we have some uh, live people here today. Not that the other people were dead, but we have live people with us, so we're going to use them. Uh, we're going to start with the opening prayer by Brother Kelly George. We'll have two songs. We're going to have a uh, reading by Mike Brady. We'll have two, two more songs. We'll uh, be studying in the Gospel of John, starting with uh, Jesus' prayer in John 17. We'll have two more songs after that. We'll have The Lord's Table by Alex Needham and The Blessing on the Bread also by Alex. We'll have some songs while we're partaking the bread, and then we'll have A Blessing on the Cup uh, by Miles Wood, and we'll have some songs while we're partaking of that. I'll come back up for some announcements, and then we'll have a closing prayer by uh, Brother uh, Stephen Thompson, who is with us today. So uh, without further ado, we'll get started here, and we'll have uh, Brother Kelly come up and offer our opening prayer. feedback. Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, we come to you thankful that you did redeem us. We're thankful that you wanted to reconcile with us, even though we make mistakes and choose wrongly. We pray, Father, that we would be able to understand that kind of love that you have for us so that we can show mankind your love and that it may prick their hearts and then they would want to come and seek you. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity that we can meet as a brotherhood uh, in a physical manner and also in a spiritual manner that we can gain strength. We're thankful, Father, for the technology that is given to us so that we can meet even though uh, we're not near one each other but we have different little satellite groups worshiping at the same time father we would ask that you would be with us throughout the rest of this service that we might be able to gain some knowledge uh, that we hadn't thought about that we can meditate upon throughout the rest of the week that would keep us um, active in worshiping you. Father, we also ask that you would be with those who uh, are sick, those who may be mourning, those who be, may be struggling. We ask that you would be with them and comfort them in only the way that you know how to comfort them. We also ask you, Lord, that you would help us to find ways that we could do your work here on earth and comfort them as well and, and uh, encourage them. Father, we're thankful uh, for those prayers that have been answered. We're thankful for those who have gone through surgeries and, and are well. And uh, we thank you, Father, for uh, Steve and his good report. We pray, Father, that you would um, help them to share their stories, that their stories can be used as encouragement for those of us who don't quite have that perspective yet. Lord, we would also ask that you would be with this country. Right now it seems very divided. We would ask you, Father, that in some way that you could Help us to come together as, as human beings and treat each other well. Treat each other by using the fruit of the Spirit that you have provided for us. We thank you, Father, again for your Son. We're thankful that he laid down his life for us. We would also ask you, Father, that this prayer would be acceptable in your eyes and that wherever it lacks that your spirit would fill in the gaps and make it worthy this we ask this prayer we ask in your son's name Jesus amen I'm in the way the bright 
bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land way. Telling the world that Jesus changed today. Yes, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way groweth clear. For I'm in the glory land way. List to the call, the gospel call today. Get in the glory land way. Wonders come home, always and to obey. For I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way groweth clear. For I'm in the glory land way. Onward I go, rejoicing in His love. I'm in the glory land way. Soon I shall see him in that home above. Oh, I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is near and the way groweth clear. For I'm in the glory land way. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know He'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land we'll live eternally. The saints on every hand are shouting victory. Their songs of sweetest praise drip back from heaven's shore. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Hebrews chapter 9. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick, and the table, and the showbread which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which also had a golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost thus signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, 
while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, and which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks, and divers washings, and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the reforma time of reformation. But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in, in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of, purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal and eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept, precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost, almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that patter, the patterns of things in heaven should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into holy places made with hands which are the figures of the two, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entered into the holy place, every year with blood of others. For then must he often have sacrificed since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself." And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. How I love the great Redeemer, who is doing so much for me. With what joy I tell the story Of the love that makes men free Till my earthly life is ended I will say, I will say, Psalms above, Psalms above Then beside the crystal sea More and more my soul shall be Praising Jesus and His love He is a He is everything to me, and everything shall always be. I will never cease to raise a song of gladness in His praise. Here and in the world above, my soul shall sing of saving love. Life and night and joy you see the precious friend who died for me. Died for me. Glory be to him forever. Endless praises to Christ the Lamb. He has filled my life with sunshine. He has made me what I am. Oh, that every 
one would know Him. Oh, that all, oh, that all, that all would adore. Oh, that all would trust the love of the mighty Friend above and be His forevermore. He is everything to me, to me. He is he everything is to me. Shall always be. always be. I will never cease to raise a song of gladness in His praise. Here and in the world above, my soul shall sing of saving love. Life and light and joy is here. The precious friend who died for me. That's called heaven It's made for the pure and the free These truths in God's word he has given How beautiful heaven must be How beautiful heaven must be Sweet home of the happy and free Fair haven of rest for the weary how beautiful heaven must be In heaven no drooping nor pining No wishing for elsewhere to be God's light is forever there shining How beautiful heaven must be How beautiful heaven must be, must be. Sweet home of the happy and free Fair haven of rest for the weary, how beautiful heaven must be. Oh, the fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me ever to adore Thee May I still Thy goodness prove While the hope of endless glory Fills my heart with joy and love Here I raise my ebony Hither by thy help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Never let me wander from thee. Never leave the God I Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Okay, <clears throat> we're in uh, John 17 this morning, if you'd like to follow along, if you have your uh, questions and book ready. Uh, we are ending the uh, four-chapter uh, section of the Gospel of John that's kind of referred to as Jesus' farewell address, uh, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And it concludes with uh, uh, John 17, which we kind of introduced last week, and I didn't want to read it or get into it because I, I wanted to make sure we did it justice. Um, this is a prayer that Jesus offers to his Father. The whole chapter is a prayer that Jesus talks to uh, his Father in heaven. God. 
Um, <clears throat> it's the longest recorded prayer of Jesus. Uh, we, re we referred several times that uh, if you Googled and kind of looked at studies about it, it's usually referred to as the high priestly prayer. That was to uh, term was coined by Clement in the 300s. That he is our high priest and that he goes to the Father on our behalf. He uh, made the ultimate sacrifice once and for all to redeem us uh, from our sins. He paid the purchase price. And that's why I had Mike uh, read Hebrews 9. It was kind of a long chapter, and, and I did ask him to read the whole thing. I, I have a hard time finding out where to cut that chapter out. It's a very good chapter referring to the things of old, how they, how they proclaimed and pointed to the things of the church and how the, the high priest who could just keep keep offering sacrifices all the time, just would always have to do that. And what do we do now that we don't have a high priest as in the order of uh, Aaron anymore? We have a high priest in the order of Melchizedek from the tribe of Judah that has offered his uh, life for us and once and for all, and there needs to be no more physical sacrifices anymore. And so that's why they refer to this prayer as the high priestly prayer. It doesn't call talk about the high priest here anywhere, but he is uh, talking to his father and representing us as only he can, as only Jesus can. So we're in uh, John 17, and uh, let's see, do we have a, up on the PowerPoint? <clears throat> I, have, I divided this up into three sections. Um, Verses 1 through 5 is Christ and his Father. 6 through 19, and we'll take these three at a time, um, or we'll take them one at a time, three, three seconds. Uh, 6 through 19 is Christ and his disciples, is who he's praying for, specifically the 11 is who he's praying for there. And then in 20 through 26, uh, we're talking about Christ and the church. He does not leave us out uh, hanging out there. He, he prays for us, which is, uh, I think... When you get to that point, you know, think about that, that the Lord and Savior is praying for you, the praying for the future people that would obey his word and uh, follow him. And he's praying for us. And so that should really um, help us be thankful. So we're going to go ahead and start with uh, one through five. And today, if you have questions, uh, some new people here today, just go ahead and yell, yell it out, and I will repeat it and uh, for the uh, people at home. 1 through 5, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you get, have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. So we have three uh, questions in our book. Uh, the first one is maybe pretty obvious, so we'll just go ahead and uh, do that. What does Jesus do in this chapter? What is Jesus doing in this chapter? Yell it out. He's praying to his Father, right? He's praying to his Father. And uh, how does he pray? Maybe we kind of just really went right through the very first phrase. How does he pray? Does he pray like we do? Yes, it says he, he looked toward heaven and he prayed. It's interesting the traditions that we have and where we might have got them because we clearly didn't get that tradition from Jesus. Jesus looked up towards heaven to pray, to address his father. That's where his father is. And he looks up toward, towards him to pray. I'm not saying it's wrong that we bow our heads. We, we do that. How come we do that? I think we do it, do it for a good reason. We're, we're submitting ourselves to him, right? And it's hard maybe to think about looking up towards, towards heaven. Do we deserve that? We do. We do deserve that. Don't ever doubt you deserve it. Jesus died for your right to be able to address the Father, to be able to look up to him. So he has allowed us to be able to pray like he has to his Father. He says we are his brothers, and we can pray to Jesus like he does. So we, we can look up towards heaven. I don't think we're wrong in bowing our heads or clasping our hands as we try to teach our children to do. 
I think those are good things. Sometimes I wonder if that's why we taught our children to clasp their hands so that they had something to do with their hands, right? Maybe to not uh, be fidgety and do some other things. But uh, uh, the, the, the point is, and what's our spirit? What's our attitude when we go to our Father in heaven? Jesus looked up towards him uh, to pray. And the first thing he says, I want to kind of hit some of these points here. He says, Father, the time has come. The time has come. What, what is that referring to? What time has officially come? What's about ready to happen to Jesus? He's going to finish his work, right? And the, the way to finish the work is to offer his blood. Freely offer his blood and redeem mankind, right? So we're talking about redemption. He's going to finish the work and give up his life and give up his blood and free and redeem mankind. The time has now come. So that uh, I, that's an important thing. I have that really underlined there. Father, the time has come. Because what have we heard from Jesus time and time again throughout the book of John? We've talked about it several times. He says it at the very beginning of his ministry when his mother tries to get him to start working and doing the work. What does he say to her? Time my time has not yet come. Right? My time has not yet come. He says that several times, and I just want to quickly just point that out to, to maybe give more significance to when he says right here in John 17, Father, my time has come. If you go all the way back to John chapter 2, that's the one we were just referring to. John chapter 2, verse 4. Dear woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. And then you go to chapter 7, verse 8. Just kind of as we're going back through John real quick to remind us. John 7, uh, verse 8. Uh, you go, um, the, his brothers are telling him, come to the feast. If you want to make a big deal, come to the feast. You go to the feast. I am not yet going up to the feast because for me, the right time has not yet come. Having said this, he stayed in Galilee. He also said, you know, for you, any time's right. He says to his brothers, right? The time has not yet come. Only Jesus knew when that time was, uh, was coming. Uh, also in verse uh, 30. At this, they tried to seize him, right? They tried to seize him and kill him. At this, they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his time had not yet come. Chapter 8, verse 20. Chapter 8, verse 20. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple area near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his time had not yet come. John 17, today we read, Father, the time has come. This is it. This is the moment. Jesus knows that Judas has already gone. He's out there, and he's been telling his, his disciples all these things in these last four chapters, telling them, I'm leaving. My time has come. I'm leaving. I'm, you're going to be sad. You're going to mourn while the world rejoices. Remember all these things he said? He goes, you are my friends. Don't be troubled. Don't be troubled. I've overcome the world. These are all the things he said in these last four chapters. Very important that he, he's going to, I'm going to send you a comforter, a counselor. He will tell you what to say. You don't even have to worry about what you're going to say. He's going to send. I will send him to you. I am leaving. I am preparing mansions for you. And I'm going to come back and bring you with me. All these things are what's been mentioned in these last four chapters of him going away. And he says right now, Father, my time has come. What does he pray for? What does he ask God to do in this uh, section? There's a key word in the first five verses. We actually sung it today. Glorify, right? Glory, right? Glorify your son. Give me the glory that I had when. Jesus previously had this glory, right? The way I was glorified when I was with you before the world began, he says in verse 5. Right? Give me that glory back. Right? I'm going to glorify you by doing what? It's, it's interesting here how Jesus is going to glorify. I am going to finish the work and I'm going to glorify you. But how is he going to glorify God? He's going to glorify God by doing something that the world actually is looking down upon. He's going to show the world his, willing, his willingness to be weak. He has the power to not let them happen, not, not let what's going to happen happen. 
And he's going to prove that here in the next chapter. He's going to prove that I have. you're not doing this to me. I'm, I'm allowing this to happen. He has the power to, to use, and he's going to show the world that he's not going to use the power. That's how he glorifies God. He's going to live, he's going to give up his life in a humiliating death. The death of a thief. The death that was reserved for criminals. That's, that's the kind of death he's going to have. And he's willingly going to do that. That glorifies God by showing such amazing humility. Because it points to the Father. Only someone that could love the Father that much to be able to do that, that glorifies the Father. That shows the Father how much, how much glory he has, how much love he has for him. The only thing that matters is his Father, and he's going to do this thing to show the world that the only thing that matters is my Father. I love him so much, and I know that he is so much higher than me that I am willing to not use my power and let you kill me so that I can do what my father has asked. My father has asked me to do this. I'm going to do it. That's how much the father is that important. And so he's going to glorify his father. And he asks for him to glorify him with the glory he had before uh, the beginning of the, uh, uh, before the creation. So that's the answer to question two. What does Jesus ask God to do? He asks him to glorify him to give him the glory to take him to heaven with him again um and that's also the answer to question three when had jesus previously been clothed in this glory and we got that from verse five before the world began we we read that of course in john one and two right in the beginning he was with god right in the beginning he was god in the beginning he was with god he was god right john one and uh two okay um I did want to point out in John 4 and 34, because uh, he talks about that it's time to uh, finish the work. And John in 4 and 34, we've had all these verses, says, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. I need to finish his work. He's been telling them the whole time that he has this work that he's doing. He's trying to make the disciples. He's trying to make people understand about God and, and about what his sacrifice is going to mean for humankind, that we're all going to be redeemed and there's going to be a, a new covenant, a new promise, and we're going to worship in spirit and truth and not in, in the tabernacle form and temple form and temple worship. And all these things are going to be changing. And Jesus was telling them all that this is the work that he has to complete, right? And if you remember... Uh, when did this actually start? When did Jesus start doing his work? When is the first time that Jesus says, I need to do my father's work? Uh, when, when he was a, a child. Yeah. 12. He was 12, right? That's the first time we have, rec at least we have record of the first time where he says, I need to be about my father's business, depending on how your you know translations are working. But it's he says, I need to be doing the work of my father at 12 is when he first started even saying that. And of course, we just went through uh, John. He says it several times about doing the work of, of God. And then what's the last thing he says right before he gives up the spirit? What's the very last three words he says about the work? It is finished. It is finished. Thanks. Thank you very much. It is finished right? It's just full. It's just full. There, there was never any doubt on what he was doing. He said it very early on. He is about the work of his father. And when the last words he said, it's done. It's done. The work is done. Mankind has been saved if they are willing to stay in Christ. If you're willing to follow Christ, you have been redeemed and you have salvation and you have heaven waiting for you. Okay, any questions on that first uh, first section? Um, I kind of divided it up on also, I, I, don't, I don't know if I even put it on there or not, but I have it in my notes to have. The, the first section is, uh, is praying upward. The second section is praying outward. And the, second, the third section is praying forward. I, I like to divide it up that way. The first section we just talked about is him praying up to God. The second section is just praying about his disciples outward, the people that were around him right then. And the third section, which I'm the most grateful for, is where he's praying forward for the church and everyone that comes to follow in his 
name. So that first section there was praying upward to his father. Any comments? Anybody want to yell out about that or anything online that we're seeing? Okay. I'm going to tell Marty, Marty, I need you to put in a question today. He says, oh, we don't have any questions. I put in a question today so, or a comment or something so we can read it. Okay, let's go to uh, 6 through 19 then. Now we're talking about Christ and the disciples. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. They knew a certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you want me into the as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Okay, so in there's a lot in this section. Um, he's praying for his disciples specifically, um, except for which one? He wasn't praying for Judas, it says it, except for the one that was, the, uh, that was destined, doomed to destruction as the scripture would be fulfilled, that he had given himself totally over to Satan, and uh, so he was not praying for him. Um, he, he's praying that everyone else be protected, and protected by what? That verse, uh, I'm kind of going all over the place here, but 11 and 12 are really important. I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of what? Power of your name, right? The name you gave me, right? The name you gave me. It says, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. Okay? None has been lost except for uh, Judas. And then later on down there, it says also, again, protect him with, with your name. Now, we've, we've talked a lot in the Gospel of John about the name. What was the name that God told? When Moses asked God, what is your name? What is the name I should use when I go to Egypt to talk to Pharaoh? What is the name I should use to show the power of you and all the miracles and the in the plagues, what is that name? And what did God say? Exodus 3 14. I am, right? I am. We have songs, the great I am. And of course, John focuses on that all the way through his book. We've been talking about that in our treasure hunt the whole time in the study, about the seven statements of I am that Jesus makes all the way through. And then the one really Big important statement where he says, before Abraham was, I am. And he said it just that way. So they knew that he was using, that he had been given the name that God had. That he had the same power that God had. And he used that name, the I am, as the source of, of the power. And so it, it's not at all um, difficult to understand that John is referring to that here too. I am come to Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that they may be um, one as we are. I am coming to you, he's, he says right there. So the I am is the, is the power that has been doing all these miracles, the seven miracles we've been looking at in the Gospel of John. And uh, um, we're, we're going to have one more really good I am here in the next chapter, and it's going to really solidify this point here about the power. He's going to say his name, 
and it's gonna it's gonna there's gonna be a demonstration of power when he actually says uh, that he is I am and that's gonna be in the next chapter I don't want to go ahead and give it all away right there so we'll, maybe we'll get to that here in a little bit okay um, he says I'm gonna remain in the world no longer he prays for them because he knows he's leaving him and he'd been their protector right he says I have protected them with the power of your name but now I'm leaving and I want you to I want you to protect them and of course then he, we know that he you know in about a week and then a week after he leaves he's going to send them the Holy Spirit and they're going to um, be able to do great things even even greater things than Jesus did Jesus said you'll be able to do even greater things because I'm because I'm gonna be with you I'm gonna be with you and you're gonna be able to be allowed to be able to do those things and I'm gonna send the Holy Spirit um, so he protected him by this uh, name. None had been lost except for Judas. Um, he's saying, I am coming to you now. I am going to, I am going to be coming to the Father. Um, he says that they, the disciples have given him great joy, and he's been able to give them great joy as he's been with them. He's worried. He's, he's, I shouldn't say he's worried. He knows that they're going to have some sorrow, that they're going to be weeping while the world rejoices, and he wants them to be comforted. He wants them to be comforted and be able to uh, get through this, which, of course, we know that they do. And then he prays specifically to do what to them. There's a, there's a good word that we need to focus on in this uh, section. Starts with an S. Sanctify, right? He prays to sanctify them, right? And what, is the, what does the word sanctify mean? To set apart, right? To set apart, not just set apart, set apart for what? In the Old Testament, when they sanctified something, they sprinkled the blood, they sanctified it all, but it was all to get it ready to, to, to be used, right? And anytime something was sanctified or set apart, it was set apart for a purpose. It was set apart to, to worship. All the utensils and all the things in the tabernacle, we, they sanctify. They had a whole process they went through to sanctify all them. It was to get them ready to be used. That's the point. So we don't, we don't want to be sanctified if there's no purpose for us to be. We, we are sanctified. We're set apart so that we will be useful, so that we will have a, a use. And, of course, is there going to be a use, is there going to be a purpose or a use for the disciples that for three years that's what Jesus has been doing he's been preparing them sanctifying them setting them apart so that they will be useful and of course they were very useful right very useful we're we're reading the words of one of them right now right right now we are studying the words that was put into John's mouth by Jesus so John was sanctified. He was set apart. And he cleansed, yes. Sanctify them by the truth. All right? That's that's what they're that's what they're used to cleanse them or to sanctify them or to set them apart. Not the sprinkling of blood of bulls and goats, but the 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 word sanctified by the truth. And what is the truth? Jesus makes it very clear here. What is what is truth? Your word, right? Your word. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Sometimes I like how Jesus uh, paraphrased some things. Like there's certain points that I just feel like, let's make sure that everyone understands. You know, it's like very, very clear. Like when he says, I'm sending you the counselor. What I mean by the counselor is the Holy Spirit is what Jesus says several times. And then here he says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. We should all understand what truth is. When you hear the word truth, you think it's the word of God. That's what it is. That's the only sure and absolute truth. We have people starting with Socrates that have long said, what is truth? What is truth? You know, it's going to come up here pretty soon. Pilate's going to say, he's going to kind of mock it, right? He's going to use Socrates' little saying, what is truth, right? Well, we know it's truth. There is an absolute truth. Don't, don't get into all the philosophy stuff that's been written forever about relative truths and all that stuff. All that stuff came because Jesus claimed that there wasn't a relative truth. That's why all those philosophers wrote all those things. Jesus said there is an absolute truth. It's the word of God. That's what it is. We know that there's an absolute truth and we need to be in it. 
Don't think about all these nebulous uh, relative truths and what's truth for you is not true for me and all that stuff that I had to study in college that just annoyed me to no end. Okay, there is an absolute truth. Never doubt it. Always know what it is. Jesus has said what it is. It's the truth that is the word of God. And he's, and he's saying that they are, they are in the world, but they are not of the world. They're not, they're not part of the world. They're not any more part of the world than I am, Jesus even says. Right? They, but, but they're in the world, and that's going to cause them troubles. Right? There's, there's going to be troubles. He, he says earlier, have no fear, I've overcome the world. So you don't have to fear that, but we have to stay here. Until he comes and gets us again, right? Sorry to be the bearer of bad news. We have to stay here. And he's also told us that there's going to be trouble. There's going to be bad things. They're going to happen to us. Any, any bad things happen to you this week? Did anybody have any things that have, that have been bothering them? <laughs> anything that upset, you know, illnesses or, or anything that's in your life? Is there anyone here that hasn't? Because I'm going to come spend some time with you. That this, this is what this is the this is the world. This is the world. These are the things that we've been promised are going to happen in this world, right? There, we have to stay here until he comes and gets us, and we need to do a good job staying here. We need to be in his work. We need to be in his word. We need to be in his truth. Anything else that's in your life that you think is really really important, you need to think about it. You need to think about that. What are you doing while you're here in this world? We need to be thinking about those things and, and doing the work. And so Jesus understands this. He's praying for this. He's saying, I know they're staying in the world. That's going to be hard for them. Protect them, Father. Protect them. I love them. Until I come and bring them back to be with me, they're in the world and they have work to do. So protect them and, and be with them. And it's so comforting that, he, that Jesus understands these things. Right, and then he's that he's praying that we see him right here praying to his father about these things that he understands the hardships that we go through in this world, and we just have to be strong. We have to be faithful. We have to just keep going forward and doing the best we can and following, following him. This is what he wants us to do: sanctify ourselves by the word, spend time in the word, and set yourself apart so that you can do the work, be useful to God. Yes. Um, did Judas Iscariot fulfill his duty? Like, was, was he selected knowing that uh, he would betray him? Yes, he was. It says that G Jesus said he knew from the beginning what Judas would do. Um, I wouldn't say that he fulfilled his uh, his his duty. I don't think he was given a given a work to do. That would that he needed to fulfill it, and he had no choice in that. I believe um, what it says here. It says so that Scripture would be fulfilled. That Scripture predicted um, what he would do, or who he would be, or that there would be a betrayer, and that he would be amongst uh, amongst uh, the people. And you know, sometimes you know we we always feel like oh, you know it's hard because like well the Scripture kind of fulfilled predicted it so it kind of has to come true you know did he not have a choice you know this was uh he was a thief even in the all the teachings of jesus he was around the messiah for that long and it, even though he heard all the things that jesus said it said that he often would he was greedy and he would take out of the uh take out of the treasury he, he would do that even though he knew that it was wrong so to me, it's not a big stretch that he had evil in his heart and that he would eventually fulfill all the things he had because uh, he allowed, constantly allowed evil to be in him and did not work at trying to to uh, go, the, go the right way. So, uh, yes, Scripture fulfilled it. He had been, he was lost. Um, he was doomed to destruction, but I don't believe it was just predetermined doomed that he had no choice in what he was doing. God knew what his choices would be. And even back in times of Moses, you know, God knew what Pharaoh's choices would always be. 
he would always be defiant against God. And so God used that. If, if, if you're, and that's the thing is like, you know, if, if you're going to choose to not follow God, then don't expect God to be helping you. He might still use you, but he might use you in a way you, you don't want to be used. He could use you. He could use you to do something bad and actually that's going to, in the long run, bring other people to Christ. If you're going to choose to go down that path, then we're going to, you know, God's going to try to save everybody else if they can, you know, to, and he, he can use you in those ways. So we need to be in the right way. Yeah. Right. He, he was aware of that, you know, um, you know, when Satan was able to convince them to do what they did, he was aware of that at the time before that even happened. Right. You know, but, um, I, you know, we don't understand, you know, the way of, of the Lord's thinking, of God's thinking, you know, because they say our thinking and his thinking is as far from the east to the west, but he That's already right. knew what was going to happen and he already had in place what he was going to do in order to 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 save us, you know. So I guess we can go back that far. Right. That yeah. Yeah. The, the 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 thing that is so comforting about, you know, whether you know, Alonzo was talking about, you know, how if the, God knew that, you know, Adam would sin too, and, and God knows, I mean, God knows everything, right? And the, and the the thing that I always just go back and rely on is and even when people, you know, they lose, they lose loved ones that, you know, were they in the church? Were they not in the church? <laughs> you know, had they done right? Had they not? And there's always those questions, you know, and I'm always, I'm always just so thankful to say is like, well, God, will, God, will, God will judge it. <laughs> God, will ju we don't have to judge that final decision. Yes, we can, we can talk to each other. And when we see something wrong in the church, we can point it out and say, hey, you shouldn't be doing this or that kind of a thing. But none of us are going to be able to say, uh, yeah, I think they should go to hell or I think they should go to heaven. We don't have that final judge. I'm so thankful that to, to know that no matter what, I can have complete faith that whatever I see, God is just. God is right. God is never wrong. He is always right. Whatever decision he makes, if he decided to choose to use Judas in this way, I know that God was right in what he did there. And it, in my human mind, it might be difficult to think about some of the things that I see and stuff. And But I just can always have this faith that I can relax back on and say, God's right. God is right. He's always right. He's never wrong. So how things happen is how things happened. And that's just what it is. And we need to spend our life and work for him so that we can be rewarded because he's told us he will give us a reward and he's right. He's always right. So if he, if he says he has, I know it'll be true. It'll happen if we remain faithful to him. We have two online comments. Okay. Uh, first from Marty. He says, it's interesting that, <laughs> interesting that Jesus doesn't pray for the world. The world is the enemy of God. We are to pray for all men, everyone, but not the world. Right, right. Yeah, the world being significantly being, you know, against against God. Because eventually here in this next section, he prays for everyone that also wants to come out of the world. That is really the way it would be. He prays for the church, prays for people that want to uh, follow him and uh, be acceptable to him. Good. Another uh, one? Or? Second one is uh, from Mark Flickinger. Uh, what does protection mean in this passage? Um, for, I would say that it probably doesn't mean what a lot of people want it to mean. Like, uh, I'm never going to have troubles, right? I'm never going to, I'm not going to stub my toe. I'm not even going to, uh, get hit by a truck or something else that might happen to me, uh, tomorrow, right? That, that's not what it's talking about. It's, it's talking about protecting me from, from who, who does he say that he wants to protect them from? He said he wants to protect them from, from the evil one, right? Satan, right. So what does that mean? That means spiritually protected. That means that, means that if we're willing to follow Jesus, that we can be spiritually protected from, from, the, uh, from the devil. I believe, I believe that the more you spend time in the word, the truth, 
The more you spend time in it, the more you spend time in the church with your brothers and sisters encouraging one another, that the devil loses significant power over you. There is no doubt about that. Significant power. Now, don't think that he's going to protect you from, from you know, necessarily protect you from your cancer always or, or any bad things that have come. We can definitely pray for that. And, and I believe that God can. If he wants to, if he's willing, he can, he can heal us of some of those things. But even Jesus healed the lepers. And guess what? They all died. <laughs> they eventually, everybody that Jesus healed, even the people that he brought back to life, they died again. That wasn't the point. The point was your spirituality. That's what you need to be, be protected from the devil and being the evil and the evil one where you lose your soul eternally. That should be our worry. That's our, that's our big worry. Now, if there's a lot of things that are going to be added to us. And I believe uh, some physical health things that, that God, we definitely should pray for those things and they help us. You know, we're so thankful that Steve's here today with his clean PET scan Praise God for that. That that is thankful. We should pray to God for those things. But this protection is the, the protection we want is to be protected from not having the devil have that much authority over us. The devil, there's not, I see, there's not uh, God and then uh, Jesus and the devil. That's not the way it is, right? That's not the way it is. There's not Jesus has power and the devil has some power. That there's the good and the bad. There's not the evil. There's the Star Wars. I see Randy. We have the, the dark side and we have the the light side, I guess, the good side. It's not an evil balance. There's not balance in the forces, right? The devil has nowhere near the authority that Jesus... It's not even close. It's not even close. It's, it's, it's laughable. There's not going to be some big battle at the end. It says that there, there's going to be, the devil's going to raise his forces against people and God's going to come. And it's over. That's it. That's, that's the end of it. So the, so the devil, we can have power over him. We totally can have power over him. We can keep him out of our lives. But it means you're spending time in the word and it means you're thinking about God and praying to him and you're spending time with your brothers and sisters in the church and encouraging one another. This is how we, this is how we overcome him. And this is what we can be by protected. Alonzo, go ahead. Right. So he it shows that God is the one that's all powerful and good choice because he had to ask permission, you know, in order to to do what he did to Job. Right. So, and I, I think, you know, that, that hedge, I mean people talk about that hedge. Right. That that hedge I think is what we're talking about here. Yeah. It's it's Job was a righteous, righteous man, very righteous, upright man. That's what God said. God bragged about him. Right. God says, Have you considered him? He, he is upright. No one, he's so upright. So why was there a hedge around him? Well, <laughs> I think probably because of that. God was saying, you're not going to touch him because I'm, 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 have, I'm putting a spiritual hedge around him. You know, not necessarily a physical hedge on allowing him to not have any troubles in the world. I, I, I don't see any place where it didn't. Job probably didn't have some troubles here and there and stuff. Physical things, time and chance, all that stuff. But... But, but Job was choosing to follow God, and so God was helping him, right? right? Yeah. When, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Don't, don't think that there aren't benefits. There are benefits from being part of the kingdom. Things will be added to us. There's, there's things, and I, I believe most of them are spiritual. I think those are the most important things. But there could be some physical benefits, too. I mean, there's love of, love of people that want to come to my backyard, I mean, that's a physical benefit. It's also a spiritual benefit, but it's, you know, it's, it's these things. I wouldn't have anybody here in my backyard if I hadn't sought the kingdom, right? None of you'd be here with me. I, I you know, it, that's a blessing. It's a blessing that God has given us because we choose to be part of the kingdom. Okay. Um, I think we got our questions to see who did you pray for the disciples, well, Jesus was the disciples. He protected them all except two. That was Judas. 
What was Jesus' request for his disciples? That they be protected from the evil one and that they be sanctified in the truth. And what is truth was our other question. And that was uh, the word of God. Okay, anything else online? And I want to do this last section. So, All right, let's go to the last section where we're praying uh, forward. Christ and the church. 20 to the end. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that, you, in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. And through Jesus, we pray this prayer. <laughs> he didn't have to say in my name. He was praying directly to his Father. We, we offer this prayer also. It's a good prayer for us to offer. And we offer it through Jesus today. So his prayer is not for them alone. Hope that, hope that verse 20 really makes you feel good. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. Right? I've sanctified them. They're going to be put to work. And their message is going to spread through the world. And of course, the Bible was the main place that message had been spread. And hopefully we'll come to believe in him through the message that they were going to spread. And how beautiful is it that this morning we are studying one of uh, his disciples' message today about this. It's, it's all coming true. That all of them may be one, that we all may be one, that he prays for a unification of the church, that we all can uh, be one, that, the, that Jesus and the Father are in us and we are in them. And he prays specifically, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. So Jesus prays. And I think we can uh, put us in that category. Jesus prays, I want them to be with me in my glory and see my glory. I'm so thankful that he wants us to be there uh, with him. Okay, uh, so we had two, two last questions in that section. Who else does Jesus pray for? That's uh, everyone that comes to believe in him in the future. That would be the church. And what did Jesus tell God that he wanted he wanted us and his disciples to be with him in heaven, in his, uh, in his final glory. All right, any other uh, last comments there? We're going we're gonna to close it up here and just do John 17. And any other comments out there or anything online that we need to talk about? I think it's a really good chapter to end, uh, end this time on. Jesus' prayer for us and uh, how he has, was willing to lay his life down and uh, be our redeemer uh, today. I think he's, I think he's pro here he's probably referring to about what is about ready to happen. I think he's probably referring to his death. For them, I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. So we just read in Hebrews 9 this morning that, that nothing was sanctified or nothing was set apart that wasn't set apart by, by blood, right? That everything had to be by blood. And, uh, um, but at, the, at this, right up to this point here, they still were doing, they had sacrifices. They were still sacrificing things with blood. Um, the high priest, which is why we had Hebrews 9 read this morning, the high priest, which is Jesus, is right now, right ready here at the beginning of the chapter. He says, 
The time has come. The high priest is going to enter, enter the inner sanctuary here in the next couple of chapters. He's going to offer that final sacrifice and sanctify everyone that wants to follow him, but also sanctify, uh, truly sanctify his disciples by the shedding of his, his own blood. So, I mean, it could be something else, but for right there in that one, I think for them, I sanctify myself. I think that's what he's, he's referring to. And he's talking to Jesus, you know, or to, to his father, I am leaving this world now. I'm, it's, my work is going to be complete. I'm going to be glorified. I'm, I'm, he's, he's referring to what he's about ready to do to end this whole, whole thing. And so when he says, I sanctify myself, I, my, my belief is that he'd be referring to what he's about ready to do. Did anybody else have a comment on that or? Right. But even baptism, it's water, but it doesn't work without what? It, it doesn't. It doesn't work without faith, but it doesn't work without the blood of Jesus. Right. The blood of Jesus is what gives the power of the power to the waters of baptism. That's that's what it does. If if that didn't happen, then there would be no point in the baptism. But the baptism does. Work. It does wash away our sins. It is our answer to to uh, a, a good conscience to be able to be able to have our sins taken away. If we don't do it, we're not answering. We're not answering the call. This is what this is how Jesus or how Paul called upon the Lord. He got up and he was baptized to wash away his sins. That's what has to happen. But your sins are not washed away with that water unless it's by the blood of Jesus. That blood of Jesus gives the power of that water. To be able to wash us, uh, wash our sins away. So, any other comments or is that it? I think we'll uh, we'll go ahead and end there. And um, thank you for uh, being with us today. On Zion's glorious summit stood a numerous host redeemed by blood. They him their king in strains divine. I heard the song and strove to join. I heard the song and strove to join. Here all who suffered sword or flame for truth or Jesus' lovely name shall victory now and hail the Lamb and bow before the great I Am and bow before the great While everlasting ages roll, eternal love shall feast their soul, and scenes of bliss forever new, rising succession to their view, rising succession to their view.
eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Evil causes a two-part problem which requires a two-part solution. Evil has the direct effect of causing injustice, a debt that must be paid. For example, if you steal from someone, it is reasonable and it is just for them to expect reparation or repayment for the evil that you have done. There is also the indirect effect of the lost loss of trust that that person will now feel for others or damage to your own relationship. This secondary evil also demands a form of debt, time spent rebuilding trust, etc. The problem for us is that we all harbor sin or some form of evil. Only God himself is all good. So in order for God to rid the world of evil, he would have to rid the world of us. This is where substitutionary atonement comes from. Originally in the form of animal sacrifice, the logic, in my opinion, looks a little, bit like, a little bit like this. God is pure, and I want God to remove evil from this world. But I am also a contributor to the evil here, so I must be removed. But God allows this animal to symbolically die in my place or atone for me, cover up my debt. That is the job of the body of the animal. With the physical debt repaid, the damaged relationship must now be restored, and that is the work of the blood. The priests washed away the damaged relationship between man and God by sprinkling of, of the blood in the temple. Exodus, the 29th chapter, tells us that by doing these things, God says, I will dwell among the people of Israel, and I will be their God. A relationship restored by atonement. And purification by blood. <clears throat> Sin causes a two-part problem that requires a two-part solution. Jesus offered himself, his body in our place for our atonement, and second, his blood purifies us and restores our relationship with God. We too participate in his death and resurrection in two ways, baptism and communion which are themselves two-part representations of Jesus' sacrifice. We are buried with Christ in the water and emerge with new life, and the bread and the cup represent the body and the blood of Jesus that repays our debt 
and purifies us so that we can be in the presence of God. Let's think on these things as we go to God in prayer. Lord, we humble ourselves before you, mindful at this time of the bread which represents Jesus' body that he freely offered in our stead on the cross. We are grateful, Father, for the weight of our sin that was lifted and borne by his shoulders. Amazed at what your sacrifice of him tells us of our worth to you. Father, this is a gift so humbling and convicting that it demands our lives in return. We've given this back to you through baptism, and we show it now as we partake in this bread keeping in mind what it means for us and our gratitude for your plan. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you. His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and be gracious. The Lord be gracious, gracious. Father, at this time we continue in our thanks for the sacrifice that your Son made and the forgiveness of sins that we have because of it and the hope of heaven that we have as well. As we are about to partake of the cup, which represents the blood that he shed that washes away those sins, we pray that you would help us to focus our minds upon it. It's through his name that we humbly beg this prayer. Amen.
From the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. He arose, he arose, a victor from the dark domain. And he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, he arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ Thanks for everybody for coming out today. I, uh, I'm going to try to order a little bit uh, sunnier weather, so it involves some uh, a lot of prayer this week and <laughs> see if uh, God will uh, allow us to have some sunny weather for you guys to come come back and be a little bit warmer. Hopefully uh, you didn't get too cold and you've all kind of uh, survived it. This is about good temperature for me personally, but I know it's not for uh, certain people in my family. So. Um, so uh, if you send some announcements in, I'll we'll go through the announcements real quick and I'll with the ones I have, and then we'll get the ones that you have a little bit later. Uh, happy anniversary to Don and Wanda Berkman. That'll be on Tuesday. And happy birthday to Alex Needham on uh, Saturday. We're thankful for Alex for doing the Lord's Table for us this morning. Uh, this Saturday is Nathan Williamson and Kathleen Didion's wedding. Please remember to show them your love and support with a card. Refer to the crew news for the Kansas City address. Keep Marty and Lisa's travels in your prayers for next weekend. We hope it will be a beautiful celebration. We've announced this earlier. We have our sign. You want to grab the sign there? I'll put the sign up here on this thing. No, I, you don't have to do it, Steve. I was, I was telling my wife to do it. But. <laughs> Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, I'm having you come up here in a second anyway, so you can bring it up. <laughs> so uh, we have we have a little sign that had for uh, Stephen Thompson had a, a PET scan this last week, and it was all it was all clear, still cancer free. So we're extremely grateful to God for that. So uh, very very happy for this good good news. So. Um, I'll have I'm gonna have Stephen come up and. Uh, offer a prayer here in a little bit because I'd probably be too emotional. I don't know what he's going to do. <laughs> so I'll start praying for him right now. Okay. Uh, we rejoice that Tom Brady's dialysis port surgery was a success this past Tuesday. Um, anything else on Tom? We got some of his family here today. All good? Uh oh. Were you supposed to tell us that or? <laughs> okay. I won't repeat it. <laughs> Okay. All right. So he's, he's good to go. All right. Um, Joyce Ingle is still at Lutheran Hospital. Please keep sending her e-cards. This time of isolation has been very hard for her, Dave, and all the family. Please pray earnestly for Joyce and all the family. It's going to be a rough road ahead, but with Christ, all things are possible. Uh, Betty Warren had her second round of skin cancer removed from her face. She had to ice it every hour for 10 minutes for two days. She's getting along well. Uh, there's a thank you note from Max Flickinger. It says, thank you to all who went to the graduation for Elijah and I that celebrated both of our accomplishments and to those who sent cards afterwards. It means a lot to me that I can have a celebration outside of school and feel like this milestone will be more treasured than it would have been if it were not for the gratitude that you all shared. So we had a really good time on their outdoor graduation. Um, I got a text announcement from Mike Warner. It says, please announce my thanks for all the cards, calls, visits, and food. I thank God for all my caring brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, I hope to be back soon. Then he has some technology things on there, but I won't read those parts. So, Okay. Um, Max and Jack will be leaving this week to spend the summer with their dad. So we'll miss them. Uh, Diamond and Dominique Blackman are in Texas with their dad until July. Riley Wood has been spending time with her grandma in Indiana. Please pray for their safe travels to Iowa uh, this week. I think they're coming back this week. Marge Turnquist shared the sad news that Sherry Nodzel's husband, Tim, passed away unexpectedly on Tuesday from a heart attack or an aneurysm. Please send much love and prayers her way. Uh, the Lighthouse News is due to Pat Thompson today. 
try to send that to her today if you want something in the Lighthouse News. Um, next Sunday, June 7th, will be our last stream. So it's going to be our last time that uh, we'll be doing it in this format. Um, if it's good weather, uh, please feel free to come out to experience uh, experience what it's like in the surround sound, I guess. You know, it's your last last chance to try to come out and try to do that if you'd like. If Hopefully it'll be good weather for you on that. Um, we're still working out a couple kinks on our transition back to the building. So sometime this week, um, we will send out what will that'll actually entail. And we'll try to, uh, we kind of want your input on a couple of things. Um, I know I said I was going to send something out at the end of this week. And uh, that's not the other two guys' fault. That's totally my fault. I ha I'm working on some things to try to get with the website and trying to get some things squared away. And it just wasn't quite happening yet. And I didn't want there to be confusion that we are, we were streaming today. And I didn't want there to be confusion on that. So. Hopefully sometime this week we're going to send something out, check your email, and um, kind of what our, our transition plan will be going back. Uh, we're working on uh, some things. We want everybody to be comfortable in coming. And uh, so in, in the interim we might be doing something a little little kind of different, but we'll, uh, we will keep you informed on that and get your input on that sometime uh, shortly in this week. All right, that's all I think I had. Any Anything else out there? Yes. So if we go back to church on Sunday, would we, once we get back in the church, would we know that we back up Wednesday too? Okay, so yeah, so all of that will be coming out. <laughs> so there so we're gonna we're we're streaming next Sunday. We're streaming next Sunday. I don't I don't want there to be any confusion on that. We're still doing what we're doing right here one more week. Okay? That'll be uh, that'll be out here. If you want to come out, you can come out. Um, and then after that, we're working on a transitional kind of a thing. And we have, a, we still have a lot of questions that we need to answer ourselves. And, uh, we have some questions that we want to ask you. Um, but that's coming out sometime this week. And then, uh, um, you can email us back or you can call us or text us or whatever, and give us some of your thoughts on a lot of those things. And, um, one of the things we're deciding, you know, you know, is like, what about Wednesday nights and, and all kinds of things and stuff and kind of implementing a new schedule also. So we have a lot of things we're still kind of discussing and um, we, we still have it covered for, you know, that's two weeks before we're going to do something different. So we'll try to get something out to you and and definitely uh, respond with your questions and comments and answers. We, we like to hear from you. And sometimes when people don't respond and it's totally for a good reason you know sometimes you know you know you're just you're fine you're fine with whatever we're doing that's great um go ahead and respond if you like you know and just say hey we're fine with what you're doing or something like that that's it's always uh, good to have that encouragement too and we want to make sure that we have everybody covered and at least everybody heard about what we're doing so and if you're not if you're still not getting the the crew news emails or anything like that um let us know again. We'll try to work that out and make sure that you're getting, we want everybody to be informed, but it's really difficult to figure out the best way to keep everybody, you know, the, the method that would, that works the best for every single type of person. So, okay. Anything else uh, out Julie, there? Julian just said, uh, thank you for the love, support and prayers and cards during this time. She really appreciates it. Okay. Uh, thank you from Julian. Allison said, being cold feels like being in the church building. <laughs> all right. So Allison's commenting through uh, all different ways. So that's great. Good job, Allison. Uh, yeah, it, it, I, it, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, we haven't had the same experience that everybody else has had, you know, just kind of basically being cooped up right there in their home and just receiving it. You know, it's, we've always had, a, you know, a small group of people here that aren't necessarily family you know, they're church family, but they're not physical family. So it's kind of, kind of been like the church has still been kind of going, but just really small. And it's it, every time there's more people here, it's just so much, I, I, I can't even tell you what it does to the heart. So it's just way better. Okay. Anything else? Are we all good? Okay. Uh, if you will, then I'm going to have uh, Stephen come up and uh, offer our closing prayer to take us out of service. Thank you.
Let us pray. Holy Father in heaven above, first we give you thanks for the day that you have, that we are here for you. And these words that we have heard today, let us take them through the week and study upon them and know that this is the purpose of our life, to be born to, to serve you. We are your servants, dear Lord. Please help us to understand through wisdom and the Holy Spirit how to serve you better and how to make you proud, dear Lord. Dear Lord, as we go through the week, may we study hard on your word every day and be conscious that that's why we're here. Dear Lord, you are the great comforter. And this we feel and see. Dear Lord, spread your hand out over those that are afflicted and sick. Help them to heal. Help them to know your word. The world is hurting, as it always has. There's nothing new under the sun. Dear Lord, this is our time. Let us lift you up and praise you and study your word. Be with those that are weak in spirit so that they may know the grand love and the grand plan that you have for us all. The mysteries that you hide are beautiful, dear Lord. Dear Lord, we thank you for everything, for all, and we pray that we realize that we are to be one together, no separation. Dear Lord, as we go into next week, please be with us, help us, have a safe travels. Thank you, dear Lord. In Jesus' precious, precious name, amen. Till we meet again, by his counsels guide up all you, with his sheep securely fold you, God be with you till we meet again. Jesus, we do we meet, do we meet, do we meet, do we meet again? God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. Neath his wings protecting us. still provide you. God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet, 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 at Jesus' feet, till we meet. Jesus, we do we meet, do we meet?